is your name? Um, to tell us if it's your background and your penguin. My name is Ayo Olobe. I'm a legal practitioner. And why did you become, why did you decide to become a legal practitioner? I was interested in the profession and my father is a lawyer who was a lawyer. Oh, okay. Now, reading through your profile on the ICG and other institutions, I was quite impressed. Why, why the advocacy, especially in the areas of electoral processes and uh, reforms and education? I can't really say something I'm interested in. I don't think that you can have a successful society without a functioning democracy. And an element of functioning democracy is the uh, successful elections. Okay, okay. Now let's go back to the period of democracy era of the 1990s. You were the president of the CLO. Civil Liberties Civil Organization. Organization. That's true. How did you cope with the tactic, tactics to set the list of the next chance of that period? I can't really say that I did. I, I did what I was doing and when they um, had things to do, they did what they were doing. There was a time when they took my passport. It's not something to, to cope with, it's just something that happened. And there was a time when we were told that they were looking to arrest us and I went underground. That's all that there was to that. Shortly after that, the Pacha died. So. Oh, okay. So the last question now, some would wonder why you bother with the state of education in Nigeria considering um, as it appears most of the education was in the UK. Why wouldn't I, I live in Nigeria, why wouldn't I be concerned about the condition of education? I, I, I don't understand why anybody would think, well, is it because the idea is that um, uh, I can carry myself or my children out of the country for their education? Therefore, I shouldn't be concerned about the education of the children here. But you yourself can see that that doesn't make any sense. We're not going to come and live here and live um, uh, in an isolated bubble. So if you, for example, are setting up an office like this and you want to employ staff, you have to be able to know that you will get an educated, qualified um, people here in Nigeria, not people who are living abroad. Many people who go abroad for their studies don't come back. Okay. And what is the relevance of an educated girl child vis-a-vis? -vis? I can't say from an educated lady's standpoint. Okay. You see, um, when people make these statements, okay. there's an assumption that I can have a different kind of standpoint. I am who I am. I can only talk for myself. Okay. So, I don't know what an illiterate woman would think. I wouldn't know what an illiterate man would think. I don't know what I think, and I think that it's obvious that um, all studies show that the more, edu more effort that is put into educating women, the more effective it is. What's your take on the political scene in 2014 vis-a-vis -vis, um, general elections in 2015? Well, at the moment, we're shaping up for a more interesting competition or contest than we've had in the past, simply because the um, opposition the ruling party seems to be shaping up as a more viable opposition than we've had before. It doesn't necessarily mean that the president will not win because um, uh, the, he holds, as they say, the life and the young. But it means definitely that um, voters who have been um, made to believe that there's only one party that can win will start to have an idea that they do have some chance of making a change. And for me, at this stage of Nigeria's democratic journey, you can see between the um, People's Democratic Party and the All Progressives Congress the, the ease with which people are moving from one party to the other. So it's not so much a matter of ideology as a matter of our understanding as voters that we can vote out an existing party, the party that holds power at the centre, and vote a fresh party. This is the kind of um, thing that we've seen in several African countries which are now making progress, whether it's um, Ghana, Zambia, um, 
Senegal. And of course, you know that in Senegal, they had not only, um, they were able to oust the ruling party after several years in which the ruling party felt that it had no challenge. But when um, the ruling party had been ousted and um, Abdul um, Abdullahi Wad, who by the way had been a member of the ruling party at one point, when he came to power and now started showing signs of Sintaitism, the Senegalese people voted him back out again. So they've had um, two successful elections in which they were able to oust the ruling party. And what that shows to me is that the Senegalese person who succeeds in an election does not feel that he doesn't have to perform in order to retain his or her seat. The Senegalese um, successful candidate at, at an election knows that it's not just a matter of getting there and sitting tight that you have to perform. Whereas in Nigeria, the things that government does are handed out like favors that they're doing to the people so that um, the government and the Senate, and it's, it, of course it applies to an extent at the um, state level, but more, more than that at the centre. When the government at the centre feels that it, the main contest is who amongst within our party will win the um, nomination of the party, and it is never a contest of ideas or service or performance. And um, whilst the, um, and, and to be frank, the PDP for the riches at its disposal does not have a good record of performance at all. But when there's no challenge, why should they need to? When they feel that there is a, an, an opposition party which can win on the basis of this is what the people prefer, then the government will start to feel that we have to sit up and perform. For example, um, the president may um, have felt, well, yes, eventually I'll get around to giving them electricity. Surely I've done this, I've established the discos. But if he now begins to feel that if I don't deliver on this issue of electricity, I might as well just not bother to come and ask people for their votes because they would say to me, what have you done in all this time? So he has an incentive to make sure that when he goes to the nation in the face of a viable challenge to his presidency, that he has a good record and not the record that um, his uh, praise singers are singing to us that um, basic things have been done, but a record of real impact and change on people's lives. If he can go to the electorate with such a record, then he has some basis. But when um, it's a matter of when well, PDP is going to rule for 60 years, not PDP is going to make life better in this, this, this and this regard in um, over, over the next 20 years or 60 years. So therefore, give us the chance and we'll show you how we will make your life better. Then um, we can see the difference. So to me, the political terrain can be interesting. It's, it's not a matter of do we like this person or that person. It's more a matter of what is good for our democracy in terms of returning power to the people. The electorate beginning to feel that it is their votes that are important rather than this godfather or that godfather and so on and so forth. What the um, experience in Senegal and other countries has shown is that um, when the people are determined, the fact that um, this godfather or that godfather um, thinks they're calling the shots, they have to, in a way, lead from behind. You know, it's like being a leader out in front. You have to make sure that your people are behind you. And if you find that you've taken off on a layer, people are not behind you. You need to retrace your steps. So that is um, what we're looking for, a more responsive democracy. And I think that in 2015, we're in more danger of having such a more responsive democracy than we've had in the past.
what you can. Um, not to one of the comments here, okay? What's your take with the ease but she has a move from one person to the other person? No, I think it's obvious that um, obviously people um, want to be in power so that they can give effect to their ideas. Now, some want to be in power so that they can chop. Some want to be in power because they can't imagine any life outside government. But there are those who want to be in power because they feel that without being in power, the good ideas, the good things that they want to do for Nigeria, they cannot give effect to them. So everybody may, some people may have their ideological position, and um, but if the ideological position is just um, blowing in the wind, it really may not amount to anything. Meanwhile, people are being born and living and dying in Nigeria, and they need relief. Um, uh, obviously, those of us who live in Lagos are particularly privileged or lucky because the governor who um, is in power now did not come to power and say everything that my predecessor did, I have to put a full stop to it or I, I reject it or is, I must do my own. On the contrary, he came in and said what my predecessor did, I'm going to build on it. And um, but whereas at the centre we can see, for example, when um, President Obasanjo left, President Yaradua came in and um, practically put a stop to everything that Obasanjo, the little that he had been doing, he put a stop to it. And as a result, there's been so little movement at the centre in Abuja compared to those states where the governors have come in and. Um, with the blessing of their successor. Now, it's not to say that um, um, sitting governors are always um, at ease with their deputies or so on. We often find that the sitting governor is very much um, not at ease with their deputy. But I'm certainly one of those who believe that whether or not um, Atiku Abubakar was um, uh, corrupt or not, that Nigeria probably would have made a lot more progress if Obasanjo had not gone out of his way to make sure that he did not succeed him. Um, uh, because Obasanjo's idea of fighting corruption, which is one that we find too often um, in those in power, is that I will have my own outfit, whether it's the police or the ICPC or the EFCC, and I will decide who should be prosecuted for corrupt activities. Whereas um, those of us who were in civil society and had been working on freedom of information legislation felt that the best weapon in the fight against corruption is transparency and letting everything as far as possible be done in the open so that um, if everybody has access to the figures, the sums, and the budgets and so on, you'll find that um, the um, it's harder for those in power to get away with the things that they're doing. For example, you can see now that the rule of law um, uh, collective of which I'm a member had um, done an examination of the 2014 budget and um, come up with some of the deep contradictions and um, frivolous expenditure. That. And it's not only the rule of law collective, others have also looked at um, the budget and said that the kind of things that the government wants to spend money on uh, do not put with the idea of a transformation and um, accelerated development for Nigeria. And um, so but that's because we have access to the budget. So when we see somebody um, writing that they're going to buy um, 10 computers at um, 5 million, then we all start saying, yeah, which computers is it that cost half a million each? You see, so all of these things become more, um, it becomes harder and harder. Of course, this is not glamorous work, it's quite painstaking. And those members of the um, collective who went through the budget and others who have gone through the budget, um, it's, it was a real labor of love. Uh, we also have a lot of um, civil society organizations and NGOs such as Budge It, I think, um, you know, which make it their business to do this um, hard 
up rewarding um, analysis which allows them to say look whether this budget is going in the right direction or not so this is the kind of um, it, it, as I say it's not glamorous does not doesn't necessarily um, grab headlines because the real objective when such are done is to have the National Assembly look at what is being put to them as the budget and to say oh that this is really not good enough we have to review it or even to um, you know we we although in the rule of law collective we said we were extremely disappointed that the coordinating minister for the economy had um, allowed this kind of budget to go through nonetheless our objective is to say look this does not even accord with your own principles look at it again and um, you know make, do, do, do a better job basically and um, to some extent immediately after the release we did notwithstanding the abuse that we got from the minister's spokesperson we did find that um, mistakes were discovered and that they would that we're going to look at the, the budget again now of course it's uh, I'm, I'm not an economist or expert in any of these things but the point is that there are things that a lot of citizens say that need to do it's not a matter of do i support president jonathan or not we're all living in nigeria as we are it's just like my saying that um, if you asked me earlier why am i interested in um, the quality of education in Nigeria. Well, I'm not going to school. My daughter is um, already finishing a uh, uh, master's degree. So it's not a matter of um, my personal circumstances, but it's a matter of is this country going to realize its potential? Please note, I said potential, not potentials. So if I don't, or not. And um, it's so very well for people to go to foreign countries for their education, for their medicine, for their holidays. But even our diaspora, they want to be able to look at their country and say, yes, that's my place. We are doing, we're doing okay. We're, we're floating ahead. They want to feel that pride in the place that they come from. They don't want to keep on having to apologize for Nigeria. And those of us who live here, whether we support the PDP and President Jonathan or not, why is there? It, does it help me if I don't have light? And I can say, yes, he has failed to provide us light. So I'm, I'm happy now because he has failed at providing me light. Why would, I, why would that make me happy? The best I would say is that the person coming in will do better. Or the person that I think should replace him will do better. But to say that I wish for him to fail so that that person can do better, what I'm setting, doing is setting a very low benchmark for any incoming person. So I think that when people um, go through these exercises of analyzing budgets or doing whatever, yes, it's a criticism of the government in power, but um, people should understand that there's um, a reason why people criticize it because they're not satisfied with what is being done. I don't believe in people who say that we should offer constructive criticism because nobody who's being criticized really likes to accept that it's constructive. So I don't think we have to waste our energies on analyzing whether it's constructive or not. The fact is that a criticism was made and it has validity because the proportion that is devoted towards capital expenditure and the proportion that is devoted towards recurrent is, um, is an imbalance. Secondly, the um, level of the, the kind of um, expenditure, the things that money is being expended on, are unnecessary, wasteful and frivolous in many cases. And we are right to say so, we are right to point that out. considerations so that 
that it becomes a matter of does he come from my place? Is he of my religion? And all these types of things which to me are really quite um, neither here nor there. And um, I think if the population would spend less time on that, but I, I recognize that it's a phase that we have to go through. Rome was not built in a day and democracy cannot spring up overnight. We have to congratulate ourselves that in comparison to those who have been saying we need some some nonsense called an Arab Spring, we've passed that stage. We've long passed that stage because um, we have to understand that democracy actually is hard work. It's hard work for not just those who are in contest, it's also some hard work for those of us who are to vote or to make our um, selection. We have to decide whether we are going to be swayed by the issue of does this person come from the same place as me or is it the turn of that person's place or um, what is the religion of this one. Not because we say that this person's religion will make them force everybody to remove their hijab or to put on their hijab, but because this person's religion is the thing that I would use to identify them. Because there are differences, you know, that we have Muslim uh, governors who are being challenged for not allowing hijab, just as we have um, Muslim governors who are being challenged for what they have done or have not done to, um, to Christians and vice versa. So I think that um, uh, we, 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 we are just now in Nigeria fond of looking at the identity of the person as this religion or that religion rather than what they do. And I think that that is um, unfortunate. Sometimes I go through phases when I have a lot that I want to post, but um, I think in the end, social media in Nigeria can never be a substitute for action, for political action. I mean, I keep on seeing this um, thing that um, 20 million youths and so on and so forth. Of course, these 20 million youths were to really organize themselves and set up their own party. They will sweep the polls. There's no doubt about it. But um, instead, you find they're busy trying to find their way into um, can this particular godfather give me ear? Or can this godfather um, allow me to um, help me to contest and all the rest of it? So they're not really ready to take the power into their own hands. Um, of course, I don't actually think there can be such a thing as a party that is just based on youths because um, you do need to have some idea of how government runs or how to run government and um, you know a lot of the people who are in power now are not old by any means I mean I don't call I think of Fashola as a very young man you know and yet um, uh, the governor here has achieved a lot and it's um, irrelevant whether he is over 50 or under 50, we understand. But um, at the same time, people have to be ready to be, um, uh, to be involved or to, even if it's only to the extent of making considered political choices and then going out to vote for them. I mean, it's okay for a lot of people to say, oh, our votes will not count when they will not be counted and so on. But, um, you know, at least you must first of all cast your vote before you decide that it can't be counted. And I find that a lot of people discourage themselves before doing anything by either telling themselves their votes will not be counted or that the person for whom they want to vote cannot win and all these sorts of things. Well, it's irrelevant. You can't vote the one that you want to vote. And um, if it's, even if you say you don't want to go and defend your vote, at least cast it. Yeah. 
multitasking? Oh, no, you know, it's not doing it all at the same time. Okay. It's just that you have different books. You, I mean, if you're the type of person that doesn't like to be somewhere and not have something to read, then you make sure that you have something available to read, no matter where you are. Thank you, Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.